Hi, and welcome to my first video in my series about nutrition. In this introductory video, I'm going to introduce you to the basic concepts of nutrition. We'll talk about some of the things that will serve as foundations for our future conversations about nutrition, how it's studied, and its core components. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Technically speaking, human beings, as well as all other animals, are classified as chemoheterotrophs. What this means is human beings need to consume food because it's from this food that we derive the energy we need in order to survive and power our body, and also that the food that we consume contains the building blocks that we need in order to construct the biomolecules for our bodies to survive and persist. The most important things that we consume from our food are known as nutrients. Broadly speaking, nutrients are broken down into six major classes, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, water, vitamins, and minerals. Sometimes we break these lists, uh, this list of six nutrients down into macronutrients and micronutrients, with carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and water being classified as macronutrients, because these are the things that we need in the highest quantities on a regular basis, and vitamins and minerals being classified as micronutrients. They're referred to as micronutrients because vitamins and minerals are things we need in small amounts on a regular basis in order to power our metabolism. But to be clear, all six of these nutrients are required on a regular basis in order for human beings to survive. Each of these nutrients plays a different role, sometimes overlapping roles, in how our bodies function. So for example, carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are broken down into two broad classes. You have your simple carbohydrates. These are things that are on a chemical level referred to as monosaccharides and disaccharides, things like glucose, fructose, lactose, and maltose. And then you also have complex carbohydrates. And these are long chains of glucose like starch or glycogen, which are ways in which plants and animals respectively store carbohydrate energy. They could also include things like cellulose or other things that serve as insoluble fiber. So if you talk about getting fiber in your diet, this is what was being what they're referring to is getting some of these insoluble carbohydrates in your body and they can serve an important role in terms of your digestive health and and the regulation of your metabolism. We'll talk about that in future videos. When we talk about carbohydrates as a whole, carbohydrates are polymers. What that means is they consist of repeating subunits, and those subunits are referred to as monomers. And the monomeric subunit for all carbohydrates are monosaccharides. The most common monosaccharide by far in nature is glucose, and the majority of the complex carbohydrates that you can consume and metabolize are basically long chains of glucose that can be broken down and utilized for energy. And that is one of the major roles for carbohydrates in your body, energy production. They can also be a form of stored energy. Now, while carbohydrates play other important roles in terms of cellular signaling and cell recognition, it's not really important for the purposes of today's conversation. The next major class of, of nutrient that comes to mind are lipids. So lipids uh, are not polymers. They don't have a monomeric subunit, but they're very, very important for numerous aspects of your body's behavior. For example, triglycerides are a form of fat that it circulates through your body. They're one of the primary means of you getting energy from lipids. Another broad class of lipid are the phospholipids. And while phospholipids don't play an important role in terms of um, getting energy being derived from them through your metabolism, phospholipids make up almost every biological membrane in your body. They are what forms the plasma membranes of cells or the, the lipid membrane that makes uh, all of the internal organelles within your cells um, separate from the, from the main cellular compartment. Without phospholipids, cells could never form, and the internal structures that our, our cells utilize to power their own metabolism could never exist either. A third major class of lipid are the sterols. Now, sterols play varying roles. Uh, one of the ones that might come to mind uh, in terms of uh, everyday nutrition would be cholesterol. So cholesterol is a very important component of biological membranes. Um, but sterols also play a role in signaling. So there are steroid, uh, steroid hormones 
that are used by your body to regulate your metabolism as well as regulating your growth and your development. So lipids play a number of different roles uh, in the body, including being broken down uh, for energy. They're also a form of stored energy. Those of us that are warm-blooded, i.e. human beings and mammals and birds, love to store uh, a fair amount of fat in a form of in a tissue that's referred to as adipose tissue. This is fatty tissue. It's comprised of cells whose primary job is to simply hold on to fat. Why? Because fat can act as an insulator and prevent us uh, from losing or gaining too much body heat. It can also serve as a form of cushioning to prevent damage and keep our bodies safe. And double as an energy storage reserve that can be tapped into in times, uh, in times when other food sources are unavailable. As I mentioned before, some lipids are also utilized in signaling, and we'll talk about their important role in terms of hormonal regulation of both your metabolism and your growth and development later on in future videos. The third, major, uh, the third macronutrient class that we'll talk about are proteins. So proteins, like carbohydrates, are polymers. However, their monomeric subunit are actually amino acids. Proteins really are the molecule in your body uh, that does things, okay? So when we talk about the way your body utilizes proteins, proteins are the, the components of cells that are used to perform cellular work. They're the enzymes that power all of our chemical reactions to make sure that they happen at a speed that is compatible with life. They make sure that only specific reactions occur when they're supposed to, so it helps to regulate the chemical reactions that occur in your cells and in your body. They're also the transporters that bring nutrients across the plasma membrane, either importing nutrients that needed to be that are needed for your metabolism or exporting the waste that your body produces as part of your metabolism. They're also the receptors that coat the surface of your cells, that help to receive signals that tell cells when to take up nutri nutrients, when to stop taking up nutrients, how to behave appropriately, and they coordinate all of the cells in your body's activities so that your body functions in a normal and regulated fashion. Now, of course, we can acquire proteins through our diet. Largely, we don't utilize the proteins that we, that we consume. They are instead brought in and broken down into their amino acid sub uh, their amino acid components and then those amino acids not unlike legos are reassembled to form the proteins we need to survive that means that they don't yield a high amount of energy uh, unlike carbohydrates and lipids which can provide a, a large amount of caloric energy uh, when they get broken down proteins aren't typically utilized in that fashion more more often than not they're going to be utilized to form new proteins in our body the proteins that we need in order to survive now, unlike the other three macronutrients, unlike, unlike carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins, water has no actual caloric value. You don't actually gain energy from consuming water. Nevertheless, water might be the single most important ma macronutrient to all living things on the planet Earth. You are 60% water, at least 60% water, and so is almost every living thing on the planet. And as such, it's important that we keep our water levels high, which means consuming water, high amounts of water on a regular basis are important for your health. Without water, there would be no way of moving things throughout your body, since your cardiovascular system, your digestive system, your excretory system, and pretty much every other system in your body relies on water to transport nutrients as well as other, other body components uh, from point A to point B. Without water, you would have no way of regulating your body temperature since water is, has what is referred to as a high heat capacity. In other words, it's hard to change. It takes a lot of energy to change the temperature of water. And as such, it helps maintain regular body temperatures. So without water, well, without water, we would never be able to survive. And in fact, without water, it's probable that life on the planet Earth would never exist. So those are the four classes of macronutrients. What about the micronutrients? What about vitamins and minerals? Well, unlike the macronutrients, which are required in large quantities on a regular basis, micronutrients, vitamins and minerals, are only required in sparingly small amounts. Nevertheless, they are essential for our survival. So what do they do? Vitamins and minerals largely function as cofactors. They are cofactors for those specialized proteins called enzymes that we talked about just a few minutes ago. Enzymes are very specific proteins whose job it is, is to speed up specific chemical reactions in our bodies and in our cells so that they happen in a way that is coordinated and at a speed that will allow life to exist. 
Most chemical reactions that happen in your body would actually occur given enough time, but not at a rate that you need to survive. Enzymes make it possible for life to exist. Vitamins and minerals are essential components of those enzymes, and without the proper amount of vitamins and minerals, these enzymes would not function at all or would function at slower rates or, is, or inefficiently, meaning that without the presence of vitamins and minerals, essentially all of your cells would shut down. Now, we classify vitamins and minerals based on whether they or, are organic or inorganic. These organic cofactors are your vitamins, things like vitamin A, vitamin B, C, D. If it's an inorganic cofactor, it's classified as a mineral. These are things like iron and uh, iron and magnesium, sodium, things like that. Now, we do need to get micronutrients in our diet on a regular basis, but we need them in significantly smaller quantities compared to the four macronutrient classes that we just discussed. So as you can see, acquiring the proper amount of these macro and micronutrients in our diet on a regular basis is an important aspect of nutrition. And this is one of the ways that we assess food quality. So food quality is an important conversation in the field of nutrition. And one of the ways that we really assess this is when we're looking at foods and we're looking at the things that we consume, we look for foods that are preferentially nutrient dense. And when we use the term nutrient dense, what we're describing are foods that are very high in nutrient content, but not particularly high in caloric content. The idea is when you eat certain foods that you're not taking too much energy in exchange for getting a proper amount of the nutrients that you need. So when we look at things like fruits, vegetables, lean proteins, these are nutrient dense foods because they contain high amounts of the macro and micronutrients that we need to survive without requiring us to consume too much energy. Contrast that with other foods that are typically considered to be poorer choices in, in a, as a part of our diet. These are often referred to as empty calories, things like soda, candy. These are things that contain very low quantities of the nutrients we need to survive, but have very high caloric content which means we're taking on a lot of energy that we need to burn off if we're gonna maintain a, a, a balanced diet and not gain, uh, not gain, become overweight, gain too much weight. In exchange, we're not getting a particularly high level of nutrients in, respond, in exchange for that, which means they're a poorer diet choice because we're getting the calories, but we're not getting the things that we actually need for our bodies to function properly. And one of the things we know is that getting proper nutrition through your diet is an essential component of your health and well-being. Couple that with the getting the proper amount of physical exercise, making good choices in our everyday in our everyday lives in terms of avoiding things like recreational drug use, consuming too much alcohol, uh, using tobacco in the form of smoking or smokeless tobacco, or using recreational drugs that may also harm our body. These are all ways in which we can uh, that we can improve our overall health. But nutrition is just one component of many. Now, lots of things affect the food choices that we make. And these different things that go in um, aren't necessarily a good thing or a bad thing, but they help us to understand why we as people often make the food choices we do, as well as why other people make the food choices that they do. These are all parts of, of how our nutrition and our diet are actually influenced. One of the things that actually affects uh, the food choices we make is how we respond to certain tastes or textures. Um, a lot of times you, this, this actually can affect people both in childhood and in adulthood. Certain foods we just avoid because we don't like the way it feels in our mouth or we don't like the way it tastes. Everybody has a different palate, so we naturally tend to avoid foods that we don't enjoy, whether they're healthy or not, and we tend to and often we will consume foods that we do enjoy simply because we taste good. I think we all know that sitting down and eating a plateful of, of nachos and drinking soda um, is not exactly a healthy choice in terms of our diet. However, they taste good to us. And for a lot of us, it's not exactly an appealing thing to sit down and eat a uh, bowl full of celery and carrots. Even though that's a much healthier choice, we, maybe not, we, may not know, we might not like the way that they taste or we might not like the way that they feel in our mouths or, or various other things. And the way that, and this can actually couple with one of the other things that influences uh, our food choices as an adult. Childhood, developing early eating habits. 
it's actually a fair note. It's actually a pretty fair thing to say that that things that you tend to like as a child, you will continue to like as an adult. And it's much harder to learn to like the things as an adult that you don't like as a child. And if you think back, there are probably some things that you avoid in your personal life today that you began avoiding as a child. Now, that being said, people's taste buds do change. But your early eating habits in terms of making decisions about what to eat and when to eat can influence us. For example, think about what you eat in terms of your breakfast foods. A lot of what you eat as your breakfast foods probably stems from what your parents fed you as a child. If you go around the world and look at other cultures, you may find that some of the things that they eat for breakfast seem incredibly distasteful for you, but not for them. And they may think the same thing about your breakfast choices as well. Why? Because your early eating habits are influencing what you think is an appropriate breakfast time meal as opposed to what somebody else might think is an appropriate dinner time meal. And sometimes these early eating habits can actually form into our adult eating habits. I think a lot of us get into routines when we get into our adulthood. It's, it's true, most of us do. And these habits, both good and bad, can influence our food choices. So for example, if you, it becomes a habit for you to swing by a restaurant on the way to class every day or on the way to work to grab a breakfast sandwich and a coffee, you might start doing that five days a week. Is that the healthiest decision for you to make? Probably not. It's fairly safe to say that it is a processed food. It's a prepared food. Now, maybe there is a healthy breakfast sandwich that you eat. Maybe it's not all that bad for you. Nevertheless, it is a habit that is influencing the way you eat on a fairly regular basis. Economics also plays a major role. It's a lot harder to actually eat healthy, at least in uh, the United States, than it, is in, than it is to eat unhealthy. Processed foods that contain uh, cheaper ingredients that contain high levels of sugar and fat content are often significantly cheaper than it is to purchase uh, things like fruits, vegetables, salads that are significantly healthier. It's a, it is an unfortunate truth that eating healthy is significantly more expensive than eating unhealthy. And the problem behind that means that quite often a person's ability to gain the proper nutrition is intimately tied to their ability to afford the proper foods that they would need to maintain their normal health. There are also cultural considerations that go into the, the types of foods that we eat. One of the coolest things you can, one of the coolest things I've ever experienced is when you go to Epcot and uh, and in Disney World, when you go there, there are all these different restaurants from all the different parts of the world, and you can go and eat and experience the foods that are sort of um, a part of the various cultures around the world. But even without that, there we all know that there are different foods that come from different cultures throughout the world. Not what we eat typically in the United States is significantly different than the traditional foods that are eaten in Germany which are significantly different from the traditional foods that are eaten in Japan, which are significantly different from the traditional foods that are eaten in Ethiopia. The point being is our cultures, or where we come from, help to define our food choices and continue to do so over time. That's not to say that we can't go outside of our, uh, that's not to say that we don't often experiment or consume foods that aren't necessarily part of what we consider to be our normal culture or the culture we come from. But in general, the majority of our diet tends to revolve around things that are normal for our particular culture and contain less of the foods that aren't a part of our, the culture from which we come. Sort of within this cultural umbrella also includes religion. And one of the things that can influence your diet or, or, or people's diet and nutrition uh, um, are their religious or spiritual beliefs. There are certain religions, for example, or spiritual beliefs that, uh, that encourage or uh, promote uh, veganism or vegetarianism, where meat is not a part that a part of the diet that's consumed. Other religions don't uh, do not recommend or do not promote the consumption of things such as pork or beef. So these are considerations that might also factor into what foods are available as a part of an individual's diet. Geography can also play an important role in terms of the things that we eat. Geography plays a role in numerous ways. So for example, um, it's often hard to acquire certain foods if you don't live near where they're processed. Either they're unavailable or they're incredibly expensive. So for example, if you live in Nebraska, it's probably really hard to get fresh seafood given that you are thousands of miles away from the nearest ocean. However, 
things like soy products, corn containing products are probably significantly cheaper since those are, those are crops that are grown nearby. If you live in Alaska, it's probably really hard to get fresh citrus fruit because it's coming from thousands of miles away. Now, while you might be able to acquire it, it's probably, more, it's probably significantly more expensive than it would be if you were to live in California or Florida where a lot of those crops are actually grown. Another key factor that goes into what we eat is advertising. And I think we all know how good commercials can look, right? You're sitting down and you're watching TV and you see that ad. And I've said it to myself, I've said it out loud uh, before where I'm saying, I don't even like that particular food, but I wanna eat that. Why? Because that commercial made it look so good. And when you're bombarded by commercials for restaurants or various foods, it's very likely that um, if something looks good to you, you may know that that's not a particularly good food choice and you may try it. Alternatively, uh, advertising can have positive effects. It may lead you to make smarter choices in terms of, of your diet um, because you can see certain healthy foods being eaten or presented in ways that maybe you would never have thought of um, and that could be helpful for you as well. Sort of similar to advertising, peer pressure. What your friends eat or what the people who live around you eat can also influence you. We've all probably sat in that cafeteria at some point when people make fun of you for what you brought for lunch that day. Well, if people are making fun of you for eating something as a child, maybe you're not going to consume it. Or if you see that every other person in your office tends to order lunch, but you're the one person who's brown bagging it every day, well, maybe those social factors might change what you do. You might decide, well, if they're all, all ordering lunch, then I'm going to as well. Or maybe you're the person who orders lunch and everybody else brown bags it. And maybe now you're the person that decides that they're going to brown bag their lunch to fit in with everybody else. Peer pressure exists and it can have both positive and negative influences in terms of our overall nutrition. Our emotions also play a role in what we eat and our nutrition. There's a reason why there's an entire group of food referred to as soul food or comfort food. Those are the foods that we turn to when maybe things aren't, when you're not feeling that well, maybe you're depressed or maybe you know, you're stressed out. These are foods that make us feel good to eat. Quite often, these comfort foods aren't necessarily the best thing to eat. Um, and they're probably something that's not, wouldn't fall into the category of nutrient dense. But our emotions can play a large role in the food choices that we make, as well as how our body processes the food that we consume. Health concerns are also a factor in the, in the diet for a lot of people. If you're someone who has diabetes or someone that has heart disease or maybe some other, uh, other health condition, that can really influence what, type of, what types of foods you should be consuming or will consume on a regular basis. In fact, there are a number of specialized diets uh, that, we'll, uh, that we'll talk about later on, uh, later on in future videos that are designed for people who have specific medical conditions to help them avoid certain foods or reduce the, reduce the consumption of certain nutrients that maybe their bodies can't handle or their bodies don't process correctly. The last thing that might influence your decision uh, would be sustainability choices. It's become very common for people um, in, in, in uh, Western society and other societies as well to make specific choices about their food with respect to how their, how their food choices impact uh, sustainability. It's also known as eating green looking for organic foods, looking for foods that, uh, looking for uh, meat, for example, that, that doesn't contain antibiotics. These are choices that people are making because they want to use their food choices to also act in a way that influences um, the sustainability of the planet, looking for sustainable fisheries, uh, for example, that won't deplete the ocean of certain fish species is another great example. Taken together, there are a lot of different factors that go into why people choose the foods that they eat. But the thing that still remains true, regardless of the reasoning for, for why people choose what foods they eat, we all have the same basic nutritional requirements. And however we get uh, those nutrients, which foods we eat, how we go about getting them, doesn't matter as long as we're able to achieve what is achieve a healthy diet. And achieving a healthy diet is important for every human being. There are five things, uh, five characteristics of a high quality diet um, that we must consider. The first one is adequacy. Adequacy refers to the fact that we need to make sure that we're getting in an adequate amount of the proper macro and micronutrients on a regular basis. 
Without this, a diet isn't providing us or our bodies with the things that we need to survive. The second characteristic is balance. Balance refers to the fact that we should never be, it should never be a trade-off. You shouldn't be getting the proper quantity of some nutrient in exchange for not getting the proper quantity of another nutrient. We need to maintain balance so that we're getting in the proper amounts of all nutrients. The third property of a, of a proper diet is calorie control. You should be getting the same number of calories in as you're expending on a regular basis. This can often be hard to estimate because it's hard to determine exactly how many calories you're burning in a given day as well as exactly how many calories you're taking in. Some people go to great lengths to keep track of everything they put in their body through calorie counters and the amount of exercise and calories they expend, but again, a lot of these are just estimates. Bottom line is if you're getting in the proper amount of calories, you're getting in the right, the same amount of calories as you're expending on a daily basis, at least on average. That sort of jives very well with the fourth major characteristic of a proper diet, moderation. We never want to consume too much of something or too little of something. It's okay to splurge once in a while. I mean, we've all sat down, we've all sat down to that uh, Thanksgiving dinner where we overindulge. But the key is that we don't do that too often. Moderation is an important part of a healthy diet so that we're not consuming too much of any one nutrient or any one class of nutrient um, while not consuming, uh, without consuming too little of another one. The fifth major characteristic of a good diet is uh, variety. We don't want to eat the same things all the time. First off, if we're eating the same things uh, day in and day out, it's probably likely that we're not necessarily getting all of the different nutrients that we need. Secondly, uh, if you're not getting a variety in your diet, you're going to get bored. There's only so many times you can eat the same thing before you just don't even enjoy eating it. And as a result, it might cause you to stray off a healthy diet and eat some other things just to sort of spice it up. Variety is a great, uh, variety is a great aspect to a healthy diet where that we're not always eating the same foods over and over again and that we're mixing it up and that we're getting in the proper amount of nutrition by consuming a variety of different foods to prevent, our, prevent us from getting bored of the foods we eat, but also to make sure our body is getting, uh, getting a variety of nutrients from a variety of different sources. The last thing I want to touch on in this video is the science of nutrition. Nutrition is studied like any other sciences using the scientific method. Now I have an entire other video on the scientific method and the different types of scientific reasoning, um, but to, to briefly sort of sort of, of go over what we talk about when we talk about the scientific method, we could break it down into sort of six easy steps for how we study something scientifically. The first thing you do is sort of uh, make observations and generate a question based on that. The second step uh, after generating that question is to gather up some preliminary data. Uh, go out, read, do that type of stuff. Um, take your observations, take that preliminary data in step three and use it to form a hypothesis. A hypothesis is nothing more than a potential explanation for a series of observations. The fourth thing you're going to do is do an experiment, test that hypothesis, set up a properly controlled scientific experiment whenever possible uh, to study that. The next thing you're going to do in the fifth step is to gather your results. So take the data that you've collected from your study and analyze it, figure out what it's telling you. And the last step in the process is to draw a conclusion. What did you learn? Was your hypothesis supported or was it rejected? What information did you get out of that? In general, all scientific studies, whether they pertain to physics uh, or chemistry or the field of nutrition, should abide by these six basic steps that are the key tenets of the scientific process first outlined, uh, first outlined by Francis Bacon way back in the 16th century. However, it's pretty safe to say that not everything that you read in, in not everything that you read, see or hear about in the media, regarding nutrition has gone through all of these steps. And one of the things that we always have to watch out for is whether or not what we're learning in terms of, or what we're hearing about in terms of nutrition or nutritional studies um, is actually valid. We should always try whenever possible to base our understanding of, of nutrition and what we know is good for our bodies or bad for our bodies based on actual scientific evidence and not just anecdotal evidence or not just you know wild speculation and unfortunately nutrition is one of those fields 
that is subject to a whole host of sort of unverified and unverifiable claims um, that are found in fairly everyday occurrence, whether it's uh, on the radio or whether it's um, on YouTube or some other type of internet media or on the television. So what do we have to do to make sure that the information that we're getting is actually good? The first thing I would say to you is do your own research. Use a discerning eye to try to figure out whether or not something makes sense. First off, is it something that seems too good to be true? So if you hear a sensationalized news, something that sounds sensationalized on the news, it probably is. Consuming large quantities of red wine extends lifespan. Really? Did the study actually say that? Go find that study. Remember, when it comes to things like media, they make money off of views. They make money off of your clicks. And all of these things can influence how a story is presented. Sure, they may have actually, there may actually, there probably is a study that's out there that says, yep, this thing actually does show to help, you know, this particular aspect. Yep, you know, when, when you know, mice were given X amount of this particular chemical found in red wine, they did live a little bit longer. How much longer? Oh, also, it's in mice? Oh, and it was just this one chemical that's found in red wine, not actually red wine? See how the story gets contorted. The thing you also want to look for is, is it a peer-reviewed article? Where did it come from? Scientific data is always written up in a way that is disseminated in the public in a form that is known as peer-reviewed uh, as a peer-reviewed publication. That means other scientists have looked at the study and verified that it was done scientifically, that the approach was scientific, and that the data should actually be trusted. Find out whether or not the source of that information actually went through this process. It's not hard to write up whatever you want and publish it somewhere. And the next thing you know, it's being parroted on Twitter and Facebook and on somebody's TikTok. That doesn't mean it's actually true. It doesn't mean it's actually a scientific study. It may look scientific, but is it actually scientific? And if you don't have that sort of peer review process, you really shouldn't trust the results of that study at all. And if it is a peer-reviewed article, find out what the study actually says. A general rule of thumb is if something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And the nutrition industry is a billion-dollar industry. Billions of dollars every year are spent by people that are looking for ways to eat healthier, lose weight, gain muscle. And, the, and there are people that will take advantage of that. One of the things that's very important that we do when we talk about nutrition and all of the information that will, I will provide you with in my future videos about nutrition are, are science-based, evidence-based information. Be careful about where you get your information regarding nutrition from and make sure that what you're looking at is actually something that is scientifically verified. And if it's not, then maybe you should, maybe you should uh, wait a little while before you go ahead and just try what they're what they're saying to do. Thank you so much for tuning in to my first video in my series about nutrition. Uh, today we talked about some of the key concepts of nutrition and uh, set the stage for my future videos. We'll go into a lot of these topics in much more detail as well as exploring many other aspects of the field of nutrition in my future videos. Thanks again for tuning in. I hope to talk to you real soon. Bye.